Şimdi Google Home Office'inde mühendis olarak çalışan Sara, 20 yıllık teknoloji deneyiminden bahsedecek. Sara, the stage is yours. Good morning, Istanbul. Um, I've had such a wonderful time in New York City these past couple of days exploring both the music, art, and history here. And it's inspiring to look at and see so many people who are excited and passionate about technology. The story I want to tell you today is about what I've gotten into for the past 20 years in my career in tech. I'll talk about how I got into technology in the first place what I've done for the past 20 years in my career, as well as highlight a couple of key takeaways that I've learned in these past 20 years. There'll also be time for questions in the end, so if you do have any, I would enjoy answering them for you. The story begins in the 1980s. Now I realize that's before many of you were born, so humor me for a second as we, as we take a step back. My first interaction with what I would consider technology was via video games. Now this is Pac-Man on the Atari, Atari 2600. This might look really basic to you, and in fact, yeah, it is pretty basic compared to what we have today. But as a kid who was maybe, I don't know, six or seven years old, this was hours and hours of entertainment, making the Pac-Man go around the screen. The next contact I had with technology was with um, a computer we had that had a very basic interpreter. So you could write, programs in the basic language, and just about all I could manage was this exciting two-line program. And all it would do is it would print hello repeatedly on the screen. Now, again, not a very exciting program, but I was frankly quite excited that I could get the computer to do anything at all. I didn't get much past this, um, but back in that day, one thing I noted was they published magazines that had intense um, listings of source code that you literally had to type in to the computer if you wanted to actually run this program. Now, that's not very exciting, and my initial concept of programming was basically taking source code from a magazine and typing it into a computer. Now, that doesn't really sound like fun to me, so I didn't really pursue this um, you know, much further. Let's fast forward to the 1990s. I was in high school at the time, and there was a computer programming class in high school. It didn't really interest me though, and the reason was when I thought of programming, I thought back to that listing in the magazine that had all of that source code, and to me, programming was basically typing a bunch of, of text into a computer, and that didn't sound like fun. There wasn't the creative aspect to it that I later become to know and love. I entered college in 1994, and I went to school at UC Berkeley. At the time, um, I didn't really know what I was going to major in, but the exciting part about going to school was I got my first email account. And actually, I got two email accounts. I mention this because it's actually pretty important as to how I decided that technology was something I wanted to pursue. So, my first email account looks something kind of like this. Again, this looks really basic. This is before we had modern web technologies, things like Gmail and Yahoo Mail. It was all text-based and very simple. So the two email accounts I got, one was one that you could log into a system and access it through only text-based menus. You could access email, and then you could also access some additional uh, internet services. It was all pretty nascent at the time. The second email account was much more flexible. It was something that allowed you to have shell access to a Unix system. Now, I didn't really know what that meant at the time, but I was interested to learn a bit more and not to be constrained by, um, by a menu system. I was, I was in a computer lab and I saw some flyers on the wall that was going to explain 
how can I make use of this new Unix um, account that I had? And basically, I took a perfect class. It was called Introduction to Unix. And the first part was, I have an account, what now? And I was intrigued to learn all the different things that you could do when you had access to more than just email. You could um, directly, um, for example, talk to a mail server. And one of the things that I, I learned in, in a subsequent class that I took after the intro class was, hey, if you connect to an insecure mail server, you can actually forge mail to be from anyone, sending it to anyone. This was back in the day before they secured things a bit, but it was interesting to me to learn if you understand how to speak the protocols of the internet, for example, in this case, the mail server protocol, um, you can have a greater understanding of how things work, as well as be, um, be more able to do things that, uh, uh, that might inspire you to learn a bit more. So this is how I got hooked on technology. I, I started to peel the onion and wanting to learn more about how do these internet services that we use actually work. So going back to my, my time at Berkeley, initially when I entered school, I thought I was going to be perhaps a psych major. I entered undeclared. I, first class I took was the Introduction to Psychology 101 class. And I thought this was going to be a great fit because I was really interested in how does the mind work. Unfortunately, after I took the introduction class in psychology, I realized mm, it wasn't quite as exciting to me. The next step in the story was, well, having taken that first class, deciding it's not what I wanted to major in, the next thing I did was try to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to take the next semester at school? I was chatting with my friend Suzanne and her concept was, hey, let's take this introduction to computer science class for non-majors. And in fact, that was the next class that I took. Now this class was actually an amazing class. They taught us to learn how to do basic programming in Scheme, which was a fairly newbie-friendly language. And what I found in this class was that the homework assignments didn't really feel like homework. Instead, I was inspired to learn more and try to push myself to do more in these homework assignments, unlike the homework assignments that I had in the other classes. One example was we were supposed to write code to do tic-tac-toe. And you can see you know, some high-level pseudocode of this here in Scheme. And it was just fun to learn how to actually get the computer to do work for you. I had a math class, a math assignment. And one of the things that I did, instead of doing a bunch of tedious calculations by hand, I wrote a program to do those calculations. So through taking more of those, those classes on basic Unix, as well as learning a bit more about computers um, through that introduction class, I decided, hey, computer science is actually what I do want to study. I spent the next three years at Berkeley studying modern operating systems, compilers, graphics, digital design, there are all facets of computer science that interested me. The one that stood out the most was the modern operating systems class. In this class, we were doing things like replacing the, the schedule algorithm in Unix, and it was satisfying to understand just that bit more about how, how the operating systems that we use um, today work by, by tweaking various aspects of them. And before I get too far into um, what I did after I had studied, I want to talk about two internships that I had along the way. One was at Intel. And Intel, I was working on a product called the Intel Internet Phone. Now this was back in the day, 1996, when it was actually fairly novel to have a concept of you have two desktop computers, and on these desktop computers you have a piece of software that allows you to um, communicate by a voice over the phone. Now, I know today in our pockets we probably already have things that can do video conferencing much more advanced than this, but if you think back, say, some 20 years ago, this was pretty novel. So my role on this team was as a test engineer, and I was writing C++ code to verify the call control module on, on this particular program. The other aspect of this, though, was this was the first time I was in industry working on an actual consumer product. And by my nature, I was interested in, well, how are users actually going to use this product? 
So in addition to doing that testing rule, I got involved in reviewing the, the documentation and making sure that the interface was both functional as well as, as um, intuitive to use. So at that point in my career, I also sort of felt like, ah, oh, you know, I'm somebody who fights for the users and takes the user-centric point of view in all of the work that I do. This becomes a theme in my career where instead of focusing just on the bit that I was supposed to do, for example, testing this call control module, I've gone back and thought a lot more about how, how we might be a bit more user-centric in our, in our work. <coughs> my second internship was working at Microsoft on the, Intel Internet, uh, sorry, on the Internet Explorer 4.0 version. I was writing Perl scripts in order to verify the cookies and cache modules in, an, in Internet Explorer 4. What was interesting about this is, while I didn't enjoy the Perl language, it was great to have the opportunity to learn a new skill. And it was also interesting to be working on a much larger team. The Internet Explorer team was much larger than the Intel team. And even through having just now two data points of actual industry experience, I started to see patterns of what I like about teams or what I would like to avoid working on teams. But this was also a great experience. It was time to start thinking about graduation. And at this point, you know, with, with maybe just only another you know, couple months left in my time at school, I needed to figure out, well, what do I want to do for a full-time job? And for me, I thought back about, hey, what did I study that I really enjoyed? And it was that operating systems class that kept coming back to me. The operating systems class um, you know, was, again, focused on Unix. And when I looked at industry at the time, there were a few different Unix vendors that were interesting. HP had HP UX, Sun had Solaris, and I fixated on, I want to work on Sun, and I want to work on Solaris, so that was my goal. There was a recruiting event that was at the Sun campus down in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley, and I went there, and I immediately sought out the, the, the Solaris recruiter, I said, oh, help me find a job on this team, because I was so excited about working on operating systems. Now, he wasn't able to find me a job on Solaris, but there was a nearby team called the Sun Cluster team. They were looking for somebody who to be a test engineer on that team. And in order to, uh, to try out that role, I went for an interview. Unfortunately, I didn't get that job, and I felt pretty gutted about it. However, I did go back, um, get an offer from HP, and then I also found out from this recruiter that there was an additional job on the Sun Cluster team as a developer working on the data services. So that was my first role. I was working on Sun Cluster, and Sun Cluster is, you could think of it as a, a failover high availability system where you have the primary node providing services, and in the event of a failure on that node, you have a backup server that can take over the services that are provided. So if you imagine a web server failing over from a primary server to a backup server, the code that I was responsible for was the glue around that web server. This was a really great opportunity for a couple of reasons. One was I got my hands on a bunch of really complicated and big hardware systems for the first time. The other was that as a developer who was working up and down the stack of a complex system, I learned a ton. As I had mentioned previously, I had also in this role taken a user-centric view and as part of that, I was using the system as the user of the system would be using it. A system like this, though, doesn't have a normal consumer like all of you using it. It tends to have somebody who is um, you know, a back-end IT engineer, so not really a large population. But as that system administrator would use that system, I was getting practice in using it, and I became skilled at troubleshooting things up and down the stack in that system. Because I was skilled at that, this led me to two different exciting opportunities. One was they needed somebody to go to Sweden in order to help with a customer installation. Because I had become fairly skilled at troubleshooting the system, I was a natural person to, to pick for that particular adventure. And indeed, that was the first time that I had the opportunity to travel abroad. The second opportunity was I needed to go to Munich in order to help train the people who were going to support the system. So by learning that bit more about the system, I had a couple of exciting additional opportunities. Let's fast forward again to the 2000s. 
I had decided after taking about three years of my time at Sun that it was time to take a break and actually do a bit of travel. So I took a leave of absence from my role and I traveled from Warsaw to Lisbon um, over the course of about six months. That's roughly the path that I took. Now, at the time, people thought, oh, you know, is this going to negatively impact your career? And yeah, you know, it might have done. But the flip side is, this was a personal goal, and I think as you approach your careers, it's important to balance the personal goals and the professional goals. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, this is one of the most exciting and best things that I've done, um, because I got to learn so much about various cultures, and it inspired me to be a bit more internationally focused as well. But the story has potentially a happy ending that when I did return, I ended up interviewing for that elusive role on the Solaris team at Sun. I got the job and I started working there. However, after spending a few months there, I decided actually it wasn't really what I wanted to do after all. And I ended up switching to a small startup company called Scale8. Working at a startup was really interesting and a huge contrast to the companies that I had worked at previously. So whereas thousands of people had worked at my previous companies, Scale8 was maybe only about 100 people. It was amazing to me that you could sit in a room and literally have every employee also be in that room, because that had never been true before for me. The other exciting thing about working at a startup was there was a sense of you actually have a thirst um, and, and, and energy towards making sure that the thing that you're working on succeeds. There's increased teamwork as well as individual responsibility, because there's this sense that you could all sink or swim together as part of, of the work that you do in the startup. So in this particular job, I was again in a testing role because I had pretty comfortably switched back and forth between testing and dev roles in my career. But unfortunately, as happens sometimes with startups, they didn't end up um, being a success. They ended up selling their technology on to a different company, and then I was once again looking for a new role. I decided to go back to Sun who was working on a new storage project, which was nicknamed Honeycomb. The Honeycomb project wasn't too dissimilar from what we were doing at Scale8, so a bunch of people from Scale8 moved on to work at Sun together on this new project. It was a dense disk array with um, some, some commodity parts to make it fairly inexpensive, but there was a lot of intelligence around the, um, the way that we stored the data. My role on this project initially was as a developer, and when I looked and saw that nobody was looking after the system testing aspect, I ended up taking on the testing role. So in this role, I was writing Java for the first time. I loaded up, I was writing code to load up the system in a way that would allow you to detect when corruption was happening given a certain pattern that we were using to store the data. And you know, this was a fantastic role. I stayed there for about four years. But one of the things that I had always wanted to do, thinking back to that trip around Europe, was I had always wanted to live and work abroad. So about four years in, I decided, okay, it's time to send resumes out to any company abroad who might hire me. One of the potential promising opportunities was there was a role at Google advertised in their Zurich office that was basically a line-for-line -line match to the skills that I had acquired. It was a role, it was in high um, back-end systems with, with a bunch of different servers and, and distributed it sounded like the perfect fit for me, so I thought, okay, maybe there's hope that this will work. The Google recruiter got in touch with me. They arranged a phone screen for me. They arranged, two on, um, they arranged an on-site interview. And, and then I'll cut a long story short, but hooray, you know, they made me a job offer. But there was one catch. This role in Zurich wasn't available. However, there was an opportunity in London taking over from a woman who was at the time on a one-year assignment that was coming to an end. So as her job was coming to an end, my job was to come in and take over the work. So I thought, great, I have this job, we have a plan. There were a couple complexities around getting visas to, to work there that <laughs> took a little bit of time to, to work out given the different bureaucracy. But eventually in the end, I left California, I got on my plane and I landed in London. However, I landed in London, and it was kind of like this. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh no, have I made this terrible mistake? You know, I left beautiful, sunny California, London, dreary, miserable weather. Um, 
No, actually, it was it was probably one of the again one of the best decisions that I made, and I've really enjoyed the past ten years that I've spent in London. So let me talk a little bit about what we do or what I did in London. Now you might recall that my background was in system software, high availability, big backend servers, and as is often the case in tech companies, things change fairly dynamically. That job that I was supposed to take over from the woman who was just on a temporary assignment, that went away before I arrived. So when I landed in London, I found out that, hey, that job that you thought you were going to do, that's not there anymore. Instead, the role that we need you to fill is to be a test engineer leading testing for our new BlackBerry mobile apps. Now, I'll be honest with you, I did have a slight panic. And I thought, okay, well, I don't know anything about mobile. That's not my expertise. Frankly, like, the phones that I had used you know, had been very simple, and these are, you know, this is the beginning of the smartphone era. But I thought, okay, well, I'm here, I may as well give it a go. On my second day, um, one of my coworkers hands me a BlackBerry phone, and I can't even turn the thing on, so I'm, you know, I'm definitely panicking at this point. But the good news there is the reason I couldn't turn it on is he had given me the wrong battery for the phone, and then I thought, okay, you know, things, things got better from there. I felt a bit more relaxed. Um, so my role at Google was to be the, the test lead on this, this new BlackBerry app that we were writing. It was a basic search box. The reason we wrote a native app on at this time was it was much faster to use this native app than it was to open the browser, type in your search, wait for the search results. You have to remember that 10 years ago, network speed was much worse than it is today. The, um, the speed of the devices was also much worse. So when we timed it, we could save easily you know, 10 some seconds by using this app. So that's what, that's what my first role was, was being a test engineer on this particular project. I was working closely with the product manager to make sure we understood what the core use cases were, to make sure that when we launched this project, uh, that things were working well. And that quickly followed with um, implementations of this app on different platforms. So we had the iPhone implementation, the Symbian implementation, the Windows Mobile implementation. All, each of those different OSs had their quirks, but it was fun to start to, start to see how the smartphone um, ecosystem was expanding. And when I thought back to my trip, when I, when I went around Europe that first time, I remember, gosh, you know, I had guidebooks with me, I had maps, I had watches and cameras and planners and all sorts of things. And today, I just have one thing in my pocket that does all of that. And for me personally, it was exciting to be in what I consider working in, in this mobile sphere that was um, evolving so quickly and being part of that revolution. So let's jump again to this new decade. You might recall that Android was not on that particular uh, slide originally, but what we started to see in the early 2000s was Android was increasingly um, you know, expanding both in functionality and adoption. And indeed, my role shifted from working on those other platforms to being more Android focused. So as a test engineer working on Android in London, I started to work with the different projects that had taken over from the historical projects we had in London to now being more focused on, on Android in London. So these are things like working on Play Movies, working on the enterprise features that we added most recently in Android, working on things like the backup and restore code. Another thing that I do in London is I lead the Google Women in Engineers group there. This is a group that um, is, a, is a community that I invest in because I think it's important to have both support and encouragement for all the, the women who are working in engineering in London. We get together and we do social activities and in fact one of the highlights was being able to go to Grace Hopper with a bunch of them. This was back in Phoenix in 2014 and it was amazing to be in a room with so many technologists. So if you have the opportunity to go to Grace Hopper one day, I recommend it because it's just this true sense of inspiration. It's hard to believe that I'll be nearly celebrating my 10 year anniversary at Google. When I look back, I think, gosh, you know, what an exciting ride. And this was really the first time that I had actively spent a long time working in the more consumer space. So working on mobile phone applications compared to the backend servers that I had pre previously been working on. So it's been, it's been a really rewarding uh, 
20 year career. <laughs> so here are my key takeaways. So number one is be curious. I think a lot of what drew me into tech was I had this natural interest in wanting to know more. It was, hey, so you have this Unix account, what more can you do with it? Hey, if you learn about these different protocols, okay, well, so if you can speak those protocols directly, what, is, what does that allow you to do? Um, the times I've been most excited and inspired in my career have been the times that I've been, been learning the most. There are some great resources as well to learn more about, uh, about various technologies that might interest you. The Women Tech Maker site that was shown earlier has also a bunch of different organizations that can help you connect and be supported as you try to progress um, through those technologies. Careers in tech is not the same thing as writing code alone at your desk. I think I had this false impression for a while, so I want to debunk this once and for all. It's great, if you want to do this, fabulous. They will let you do this. You will be able to be successful having a career in tech, writing code alone at your desk. But if that doesn't sound appealing, that's not a reason not to pursue technology. Um, there's a bunch of different, different roles in t that allow you to be both technical, but where you're not trapped at your desk all day writing code. Um, some of the best software engineers I work with have a much more varied role. It's much more collaborative as well. So what I find in tech is whether you're a test engineer like myself, whether you work in UX, whether you work in product management or program management, a software engineer, a system administrator, all of these roles both require a bunch of collaboration as well as require um, you know, to, to just have ability to be technical up and down the stack. So, if you're put off by this concept of, okay, well, I don't want to be working in tech because I don't want to be isolated at my desk, I can officially debunk that this is not the case, and you will have the opportunity to be much more collaborative and have a much more varied role. The next takeaway is step outside of your comfort zone. When I reflected on, on specifically my most recent job at Google, I realized, you know, if somebody, while well, I was from San Francisco, had said, hey, do you want to move to London to lead, test, to lead testing on a mobile application? I might have thought they were crazy to even suggest such a thing, and I might not have even taken that role. And that would have been a huge mistake. So luckily for me, I wasn't asked. I was sort of just you know, put in the situation and allowed to kind of sink or swim on my own merits. But I would highly recommend thinking about, hey, Maybe don't say no before you give something a shot, because I would have been seriously regretful had I not taken the opportunity to move to London. Focus on the user. Um, I feel like a lot of times in my career, I would reflect on, hey, this is what the user is going to be doing, and therefore we should really focus on making that work very well. Focusing on the user helps with prioritization, um, you'll find that when you, when you go throughout your technical career, you'll have a bunch of different competing priorities. And when you bring things back to the user, you can ensure that, hey, you are doing things that, else, that have both the most impact and will hopefully make the users happy. So this was a key takeaway and also drove a lot, of, um, a lot of the work I had done throughout the course of my career. So seek help and help others. Um, I'll be honest with you, the computer science degree for me was really difficult. I wouldn't have been able to succeed at it unless I had the assistance of a number of mentors along the way. So if you, if you find that you need help with something, you don't know something, it's okay to ask. You know, there are people here who will support you. There's a bunch of great resources to get that support. And I throw that around for those of you who are more senior and who know a bit more. You know, please help those who are aspiring to, to learn more about technology. And the last point is the importance of diversity. Technology is pervasive in our lives. We can't get away from it. So when I think about the teams that we are building, it's critical that we have women in technical roles in order to make sure that we're producing the technology that all of us can use and that works for all of us. So I would encourage all of you to you know, engage with technology. And in fact, I look forward to hearing about the technology that each of you creates as you go throughout your career. And finally, before I wrap up, I'd like to say a word of thanks. 
The organizers have done a fantastic job in putting this together. I know how much work goes into producing events like this. Countless volunteers and organizers have really spent their time to bring all of us here today and have an inspirational day. So thank you to all of those who made that possible. And with that, I'd be happy to open this up for questions. Anyone? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yes. In your point of view, what makes women get out of from uh, taking the street? What is the main reason of uh, So I'll repeat the question. Um, the question was, in my point of view, what makes women get out of the tech, in tech industry? Um, what is the main reason for that? Um, it's a good question. I think people have different, different reasons for that. So on the one hand, it's not always about people getting out of the tech industry. Part of the problem is people getting into the tech industry in the first place. So. I think part of it is, when you think about women in tech, um, or indeed when you think about technology, there is this image of, hey, you are sitting alone coding and, and you know, being geeky with a bunch of your male geeks, and that's, that's not an appealing image. So I think we need to change that image to get more people into tech in the first place. And then, on the flip side of that is, why do people leave technology? I don't have a lot of statistics about why people leave my sense is people move around within tech, so I know a lot of people who might start as a software engineer and then pursue something different, and that's what I did. I started as a software engineer, and then I ended up pursuing more of a testing-focused role, and indeed my role at Google is a bit, you know, maybe halfway program management, halfway test engineer. I think it's natural through one's career to want to pursue different, you know, different role facets. I don't have a good answer why people leave tech. I don't have the statistics to show it. Uh, what those numbers are, but what I, my goal anyway is, is to hope is hopefully inspire people to realize that tech is a great first career, and let's let's get a bunch of people into tech initially, and on, on the retention side, we can also focus on better mentoring, better networking, building communities like the women tech makers who are providing that support, and I'm hopeful that those things will help get more people into tech and then allow them to stay. Any other questions? Surely somebody has a question. I'd be happy to stay here as well if you want to ask a question, um, you know, privately. But don't be shy. We'd, we'd love to. We'd love to benefit from. <coughs> Going once. Yeah, so, so if anybody wants to ask the question in Turkish, then I, I'm assured by my, like, my, my lovely translators that they will, that they will translate it for you. Future plans for my career. Gosh, if I knew that. Um, <laughs> my manager and I talk about this all the time. Um, so, so I work in Android, and, and I love that space. I sort of feel like if I stay still, the mobile phone environment changes so dramatically around me that I don't actually have to put a lot of effort into, into changing things up because it's so dynamic around me. Um, you know, we're working on the next version of the OS right now, it's, and, it, and it's an exciting space to be in. So I, I'm pretty happy there. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm, so I'm living in London now, I've been there for 10 years, maybe I'll stay there, maybe I'll find a different role at Google, but I'm pretty content, like I managed to find a role that, that I both enjoy quite a bit, that offered me the dynamic um, kind of learning opportunities, because there's new things all the time in Android that I'm working on learning. Um, so yeah, I think, I think for now I'm staying put, but you know, let's see, huh? <laughs> Any other questions? OK, I think then it's break time, unless I'm not seeing a hand. Cool, and pass back to the organizers. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. We are very pleased to have you.